This game is the franchise. Oh, what a shot! I don't believe it! Stevie Franchise. He has a name that says the weight is on his shoulder. In the beginning, those shoulders could barely lift the ball to the rim. He was very athletic, but he was very tiny. And he would always say, am I getting bigger now? Am I getting bigger? His body grew. And so did his reputation. A local legend, you know, he's one of those guys you hear about on the playground. He owned the gym. He stirred everybody up in there. Then tragedy derailed his promising career. There's not a day that go by that I don't that I don't think about that. But you can see him shutting down. We couldn't do a whole lot for him. He completely stopped playing basketball at all. I mean, it just wasn't there anymore. I said, what are we gonna do now, Jeff? I said, Steve, God gonna take care of us. <laughs> Slowly he healed, and the passion returned. It sort of became apparent that that dream was just put on hold, that he's picking it back up now. All of a sudden, he started really seeing how good he could be. Oh, what an athletic play by Steve Francis. The legend of Steve Francis just took off from there. You want excitement? This is Steve Francis. You got it. Wow. Beyond the glory. The Vancouver Grizzlies select Steve Francis. He introduced himself with a whine. The Maryland guard looked like he might trip over his bottom lip. What you saw draft night was a disappointed person. You know, I was going to be so far from my family, from my grandma. He's not a phony. You may love him or not love him, but he's going to be himself. Steve, what happened there at They're the end of the half? Him, man, that's all I'm saying. That's uncalled for. It's a motion that stokes his fire. An emotion that lands him in hot water. Hanging on the rim, extra long. Gold medal by that's a hard foul. He leads the NBA in technical fouls. Francis fouled him, and it's a flagrant foul. Oh, now they are really yakking, James. Look at him. Now Francis took a swing. A stiff off. It's unbelievable. At a very young age, he wouldn't back down from nobody. Uh, he was he was sure about his game. There was so, uh, so much stuff that you can do. We had people uh, who really cared for, you know, the kids growing up, knowing that a lot of the kids living there uh, had single parents. Because even though we loved it, the conditions wasn't always right. You know, being on food stamps, a lot of us on food stamps and stuff growing up like that. You get in trouble. If you, if you hung out with the wrong crowd, you definitely could. My mother used to watch out the window all the time. We had to make sure that he was in the house at a certain time. You know, my mother didn't play that, especially with him because he was the youngest. My original father, he, he left um, my mom when I was like two years old. He made decisions in his life that, hey, he needed to move on. And, you know, we, we just, you know, dealt with him. My father would come around every so often, but, you know, things just got kind of tough and tight. And, you know, it was, I guess it was time for him to leave. My mom, man, that's... Um, I mean, there, there, there's so much that I can talk about. I can remember at times when we lived on Maple Avenue in Tacoma Park. We had like 14 people staying in a three-bedroom apartment. Some of my friends are, are getting to it with their parents, and... You know, 12 at night, they'll come knocking on the door. I open the door, let my mother know they're there. She'll let them in. Tomorrow, she'll have one-on-one -on -one with them. Come on, 
when Steve wasn't at home, he could usually be found at the local basketball courts. He was always dribbling, doing the tricks between the leagues. You no, know, really could handle the basketball very well at a very young age. I did it so much, man, that I used to get kicked out of stores. I used to go in the, the, the local sub shop, you know, bouncing the basketball, throwing the basketball off the wall. Yeah, he was very athletic, but he was very tiny. And so he couldn't get the basketball to the rim from a long distance. I used to mark my height every day. I used to come in the bathroom in the morning when I got out. And, um, you know, I try to check your height. So there's a wall behind me right in the bathroom. So I'm marking my height. So for like four months, it didn't move. So I'm telling my grandma, I'm like, I'm, I ask her every day, I'm like, am I going to grow? Am I going to grow? I never thought that I would pass like 4'11". He wanted to be taller. He wanted to be tall. This was just like, I can't stand being this short. You know, I got I to I grow. I want to grow. But Steve never let his size dictate his style of play. He was able to take a hit, make a pass, score, whatever. I mean, he had no problems getting in there. Yeah, he would definitely take it to the hole. He wasn't scared. I mean, he wasn't scared at all. And we was playing, like, with the 18 and older, and they didn't have no mercy on him because he was small or young. You know, it's a good thing they had the mats behind the backboard because he, he was going to hit them. I seen him as a little kid, actually, um, when I used to speak at the basketball camps uh, when I was in college, and I see these kids playing, and then I see this little waterhead kid off, off to the side just shooting, layups, reverses, dribbling. When it was his turn to go in, he'd go in the game, play. After he would finish, he'd come back on the sidelines and just work on this game instead of being like everybody else who was sitting on the sideline watching the game. We were at one of the gyms in Maryland, and we only had four players. We were sitting on the sideline, and he was like, let me play, let me play. And I was like, nah, man, he's too small. Nah, man, you know. And he was begging me let him play, let him play. I mean, he thrilled me right away. I mean, he was running up and down the court. I wasn't even playing as much. I was too busy watching him. The thing that he possessed that I saw that a lot of people didn't have was he played ball from his soul. It was like it was something inside of him. Steve was a star at Tacoma Park Middle School, but success didn't come so easily at Blair High. I thought I was the big man on campus. You know, he's little Stevie. He's, he's going to be the next star to come out of Blair High School. And then when I got there, you know, coming from middle school to high school, the whole atmosphere just changed. You know, you see so much going on in high school. You know, you see guys skipping school, going to hang out, uh, drinking and smoking and doing things like that. I guess the excitement of being in high school and being around the older guys, which is natural, he lost focus for a second. You know, normally people have like a senior skip. We had a skip party like once a week. We had to do a lot of chasing around and, and um, finding out where he was and some other students. I didn't play. I didn't play basketball until my sophomore year. I didn't have the grades. Sophomore year, I'm third point guard on the list behind a guy who I think I'm better than. And uh, me and my boy Jason Mascara, he, he was in front of me. Playing time and, and uh, was pretty, pretty slim in terms of trying to get everyone in. My sophomore year, actually, I got kicked off the team. I got suspended, and then uh, they kicked me off the team. I was so upset because, you know, I had dreams of being a basketball player, playing high school. I had dreams of, you know, taking my team to the state championship, and, you know, I, I, I didn't get a chance to play. Just a sophomore, Steve would never play another game of high school basketball. He just got the word that he won't be allowed to play. And I'm like, man, all the talent that I have, all the hours that I put in, you know, and I'm out here, excuse me. But a shocking loss would take the heaviest toll. Night that he found out, then he just, he just, he just bur bursting into tears. He said, Jeff, what are we going to do now? And I said, Steve, God going to take care of us. just bur bursting into tears. He said, Jeff, what are we going to do now? And I said, Steve, God going to take care of us.
Jesus. I was so excited to be in that dunk contest. I ain't even stretched before the dunk contest. I was just all pure adrenaline. Oh, Steve. That is awesome. I got to give him the 10 on that one, ladies and gentlemen. Just came out, you know, dunking ball. Steve Francis is one of the premier dunkers in the NBA. But midway through high school, it appeared that he may never be tall enough to even touch the rim. Then he had the growth spurt he'd been dreaming of. He was like 5'4", five, 5'6", five, and then just came back and he was like 6 feet or something, you know, over like two weeks or so. You know, it was like, where the hell is he getting this from, you know? <laughs> and we was all out there playing around, and he just picked up the ball and, I mean, dunked it, really dunked it. And uh, everybody was like gathering around, was like, boy, dunk it like that. But Steve's highlights were all on the playground. Kicked off his high school team after his sophomore year, he transferred schools, but couldn't return to the court. Well, my junior year, I went to Kennedy because we moved from Tacoma Park out to the boondocks. The rules prohibited me from playing the first semester. Montgomery County schools wouldn't allow you to transfer and play ball, so it was real hard for him at the time. No, the second semester, my grades went down again and I wasn't able to play. It was tough, man. Just knowing, looking at the competition, looking at the guys that I played Little League with, and they're out there, you know, they're all met, they're all counting. I'm like, damn, man, I'm, I, I think I'm better than these guys. Steve transferred back to Blair, but county rules and poor grades, again, kept him off the court. Uh, we just got the word that, hey, he can come return to Blair, but he won't be allowed to play, uh, which was another big blow for us, but certainly for him, who really needed um, to play. Steve needed direction, but his older brothers had moved out, and his mother, Brenda, had fallen ill. For maybe 10 years, she had had a hernia uh, behind her heart. You know, she lived with that. She was very fearful of surgery. Well, mom was, uh, you know, she was sick for a while. She would be in and out of the hospital. There was certain medicines that she needed. We really couldn't afford all of it that she needed. Went up there to see her. Well, her eyes were uh, kind of yellow. And I couldn't control my emotions because I never saw my mother not being able to do something. Never saw her like that. You know, I was home with her and she started throwing up blood a little bit. The only thing that she would tell me was to make sure that my brothers and my sister and everybody was taken care of. In March, Brenda died of cancer. She was 39. I get like, 10 pages in a row for my cousin. And I called her. And, um, I mean, she was crying. And, I mean, at that point, I pretty much knew. I was driving him home, and then he just, he just bur bursting into tears. Mm -hmm. You know, he's asking me questions like, what's wrong? And I'm like in the front seat, but I'm like balled up on the floor, like feeling, feeling so sick, man. Not her, you know, and what, it, it could, it's not her. You know, you, you gotta understand something. This woman, this woman, um, it's been a long time since I talked to my mother. I never thought, I never thought that she would, I would be without her, you know what I'm saying? It, it was something that really, you know, changed my life. And Steve, I'll never forget, the day after, went over Grandma's house. He had the pits. And I just try to stay strong, but I, Steve, I believe he looked at me. He said, what are we going to do now, child? I said, Steve, God going to take care of us, man. What are we going to do? I was just out of high school and kind of lost in my way. 
at the time and Steve was in high school at the time and you know Jeff was married with his family we didn't have too much we had love within that little core that's where she left mine she literally left love behind something tangible something that you can feel something that was real Anything that happened within those three months, like after that happened, I, I, like people tell me they would see me, and I'm like, oh yeah. Oh, uh, very devastated by it. Very devastated. I, he, he didn't finish high school. He can, he completely stopped playing basketball at all. I mean, it just wasn't there anymore. You can see him shutting down. You know, this we couldn't do a whole lot for him. I miss my mom so much. It's been 10 years and, I, I, and there's not one day, there's not one day that goes by that I, I don't think about, you know, certain situations, things that she did, you know, um, with me and with my brothers and even for my whole family. There's not a day that go by that I don't, that I don't think about that. For three months, Steve Francis was lost trying to make sense of his mother's death. He decided to use it as motivation. It might have broken him down to realize how precious life is. And then also gave him the knowledge to go forward with his dream. Back at Tacoma Park, Steve continued to play basketball, mostly pickup games in the basement of the local firehouse. He began to develop a reputation. Everybody just congregated to this little firehouse, and it was in the basement. And uh, wooden backboards, and everybody would come there. And I'm dogging guys. I don't care where they were coming from, from D.C., Virginia, Maryland. The great city ballers, you know, from all over D.C., Maryland, come up there and play. And, you know, he served everybody up in there. A lot of people thought that, you know, Steve would be just a playground legend where, you know, he was talented enough to make it, but, you know, will he ever put himself in a position, you know, to get to college to be able to, to do that? The whole time. And I'm like, man, what am I going to do next? What am I going to do next? Steve decided to try his hand again at organized basketball. He refocused and rededicated himself. And he has an opportunity to play AAU, Junior Olympic Ball, with Lou Wilson. You know, he's been watching me play all this time. He's like, yo, it's time for you to get your act together, you know, and get back on the basketball court and, uh, you know, do, do some of the things, you know, that you... That you capable of doing. Guys, I'd like to work with him and see if we can get him on our amateur athletic union team and we could travel and maybe get him a little more exposure since he didn't play uh, high school. Wilson took Steve to Florida for a tournament. The trip changed his life. He has such charisma and such style that the little kids would come up to him after the games asking for autographs gave him an opportunity to be seen by colleges so that he could obtain a scholarship. My assistant coach called me one day and I think I found a kid, pretty good player. And I said, well, where did he play high school? He didn't. You know, I kept saying, well, where's he from? Well, I don't know. Steve was offered a chance to play at San Jacinto Junior College. I'm looking at Lou. I'm like, where is San Jacinto College? He's like in Texas. I'm like, Texas? He gave him an opportunity to be seen by colleges so that he could obtain a scholarship. My assistant coach called me one day and I think I found a kid pretty good player and I said, well, where did he play high school? He didn't. You know, I kept saying, well, where's he from? Well, I don't know. Steve was offered a chance to play at San Jacinto Junior College. I'm looking at Lou. I'm like, where is San Jacinto College? He's like in Texas. I'm like, Texas? I never thought about leaving Maryland to go all the way to Texas to go to school. So I get back home, you know, talk to my family about, 
you know, the possibility of, of, of going to San Jacinto. So my grandma was like, it might be the best thing for you. Then I made the decision to go, of course. Steve was 18 and a long way from home. Oh, yeah, he definitely was homesick. He was calling, like, every week, just basically ready to go AWOL <laughs> down there talking about he's going to come back home. They're like, don't ever come back, man. I was like, just stay down there, man. When he went to San Jack, that's all I used to hear out of him. You know I love you. You know I love you. You know, it, he most definitely was homesick. I'm crying every day telling Coach Janana and Coach Rose, I want to go home, I want to go home. Steve had now grown to six feet three, and his vertical leap had reached an astonishing 43 inches. He hadn't played organized ball for a couple of years, so he was kind of raw. But about halfway through the year, all of a sudden, in games, you started really seeing, you know, how good he could be. I remember sitting there, I turned to someone next to me, as you know, Steve could be playing for a lot of money someday. And we made it all the way to the national tournament. We were 36 and up before we lost in the national championship. Steve had a great tournament, made the all-tournament team up there, and although we got beat uh, in the championship game, he, he re that's when he really started getting the interest of people. Steve was suddenly in demand. He chose to transfer to another junior college, this one just two hours from home. Yes, his brother brought him up, and uh, they looked around the campus, and we talked with him, and, you know, you love the kid right away as soon as you talk with him. And uh, he said, you just have to believe in me. I'm going to get you to where you want to go. I'm going to get you to the school you want to get to. And the legend of Steve Francis just took off from there. And there were several times when Steve was here that we couldn't get everybody in our gym. Those games were like kind of like priceless games because like you never knew night in and night out what he might do. Steve Francis! I was like 26, like five steals a game. And this is Francis! Boom! Bang! Oh, wow, Steve Francis! It's the Steve Francis Show! We were undefeated. We were 30-0. and 0. It's the only undefeated season we've ever had. Showtime! Bang! Reverse! It sort of became apparent that that dream was just put on hold, that he's picking it back up now. Gary Williams, the head coach at the University of Maryland, wanted to see for himself what the fuss was all about. You heard a lot about him during the summer, too. Like, he'd do these unbelievable dunks, or he'd have 40 in a game. And Steve Francis hangs and scores. That word gradually gets out. And a steal by Francis! Man, when he was there, I didn't miss, man. I'm just pulling up for three. Da, 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 da. And everybody, you know, everybody's, everybody knows why I'm doing it. After the season, Steve transferred to the University of Maryland his sixth school in six years. I don't think there's been that much hype about one player coming to a school around here in a long, long time. This is the next level for him. You can just see it in his eyes. Stevie Francis! Showtime! You want excitement? You got it. Wow! Led by Steve, the Terrapins won their first 10 games. We, we were unbelievable. We beat Stanford, which was supposed to be the, one of the top teams. That's when I grew up. Oh, my! Francis for three boys, nine for nine. On his birthday uh, in um, Atlanta, Georgia, against Georgia Tech, he went baseline on Jason Cardi. I mean... He had, like... 25 points, had like seven dunks. Steve was magnificent, averaging 17 points and nearly five assists per game. When the NCAA tournament rolled around, expectations were high. Steve led the Terps to victories over Valparaiso and Creighton. But injuries had slowed the team. And they fell to St. John's in the third round. You know, I'll never forget that game because I thought that team with Steve was good enough to win it all. When the season ended, Steve had to make a decision. Finish his college career at Maryland or turn pro. 
he really wanted to get to that final four and win the championship. But as we did the evaluation of talking to the NBA and different teams, it was hard for him to go back. Clearly, he was a lotto pick. The real issue was where was he going to go in the top one, two, three. In just three years, Steve had gone from high school dropout to NBA lottery pick. But the day he dreamed of wouldn't go as planned. With the second pick in the 1999 NBA draft. Don't draft Steve. He does not want to play here. The Vancouver Grizzlies select. I do not want to play in Vancouver. So we're at the draft. So it's in my hometown. It's at the MCI Center. So it's jam packed. My family, my grandmother, everybody, we're all sitting there. So I'm excited. I'm like, yeah, Chicago about to pick. You know, they about to pick. They about to pick. I'm about to get number one pick. He's been mentioned all week as a potential number one. And what a night this promises to be for Steve Francis. Steve Francis was on the doorstep of a dream. Only one thing could ruin it. I'm like, man, Jeff. I do not want to play in Vancouver. He's like, Steve, I understand. So, I mean, I'm repeatedly telling this because we knew they had the number two pick. Don't draft Steve. He does not want to play here. David Stern, the commissioner, comes up to the podium. With the first pick. And with the first pick, the Chicago Bulls select. I'm like, yes. Elton Brand from Duke University. Elton Brand, I'm like, then he goes back up to the podium. With the second pick in the 1999 NBA draft, the Vancouver Grizzlies select. So I'm down like this. Steve Francis from the University of Maryland. My grandma told me, you know, don't poke my lip out. Go up there. The Maryland guard looked like he might trip over his bottom lip on the way to the podium. So I'm up there shaking the commissioner's hand, and he says to me, don't worry about it, there'll be better days, you'll have a great career. Unfortunately for the Grizzlies, the expression on Francis's face spoke volumes. And it took us nine hours to get to Vancouver. I'm like, man, how's my family going to come see me? How am I going to be able to go home and see my family? The year before, the Grizzlies had selected point guard Mike Bibby. It was unclear where Steve would fit in. They really didn't have a, a concrete answer for me, like where I was gonna play. So then I, I, I told Nate and Jeff, I was like, hey man, y'all my agents, y'all gotta get it done. Steve held out. He demanded a trade. There's no question in the public eye there was some damage. Fans already perceive us as spoiled, and when you're able to come out and, and dictate where you want to play at and things like that, I mean, that just magnifies that. So, uh, of course, you're going to know the fans going to be rubbed the wrong way. Not saying that I, I should have my way, but I just think if I'm doing business with somebody and they said they don't want to do business with me, I wouldn't do business with them, plain and simple. We had to sit back and make a decision. What's going to be best for Steve Francis? I mean, you know, and it's the standard we took. We spoke with a number of general managers, and Houston was a city and a team that had the right components of issues with the cap. It was, the, at that time, the largest trade that ever... Houston was a city and a team that had the right components of issues with the cap. It was, the, at that time, the largest trade that ever been done in the NBA. Yeah, I think it was 13 players involved, which was, uh, it, t it takes a lot of time just to trade one player for another today, and it took forever to do this one. All of a sudden, I hear Houston. I'm like, this is, this is unbelievable. I was jumping up and down forever, man, and they told me I got traded to Houston, man. I was so excited. Houston, at the time, you had three, you know, top 50 guys. You know, he wouldn't be thrown into the fire. I mean, you could learn from Akeem Olajuwon, a Charles Barkley, a Scotty Pittman at the time. Well, Scotty got traded before I got there. Barkley got hurt. Akeem was, you know, in and out. He got injured. He's the only one left. So he ended up learning a lot, but not how we planned the learning. He learned by doing and performing. And, you know, he can rise to any occasion. 
Steve Francis taking it. Oh, how did he make that? Steal by Stevie Francis. Look out. He wasn't overwhelmed with the league. He felt like he belonged right away, and that's a big challenge to most guys coming in. Francis says, this is the way you do it. Oh, what a shot. I don't believe it. He felt comfortable pretty much right away. And Francis flies through the air. Oh! Gary Payton's on a fast break, so he's going for a layup. I said, give me that So Gary Payton's like, oh, this little young wants to talk trash. Now they are really yakking. Look at it. We were face to face, and I'm like, damn, this is Gary Payton right here. This is my rookie year. Guys really came at him a lot. And so, you know, he just wouldn't back down. Steve's play quickly repaired his image, but the fans in Vancouver weren't so forgiving. Oh, my goodness. In Vancouver, a very hostile crowd awaiting. Steve Francis here this evening. I know people outside the arena can hear it. It just rang out. Guys were throwing things from the rafters onto the court. People were throwing batteries, tomatoes. It was really hostile crowd out there. All rejection inside. Well, that'll go down as a highlight for Grizzlies fans tonight. Oh, what an athletic play by Steve Francis. I go out there, man. I'm making shots. I'm throwing the ball up the backboard through the lane, dunking it, and, and I'm having a great game, and we win. Francis, crossover, elevates, sticks the jumper. Steve averaged 18 points and nearly seven assists per game in his rookie year and formed a bond with head coach Rudy Tomjanovich. In the first day, at the training camp, he said, hey, stay ball. I'm just going to give you the ball and let you go. And from that day, man, I, I, I just went. In Steve's second season, the Rockets won 45 games, an 11-game improvement over his rookie campaign. But Steve's third year would prove disastrous. Every other day, I'm like, damn, I'm dizzy, I'm dizzy. So I go to a team training, I'm like, I, I need to see a doctor, something's wrong. It's like his head pounding, you know, seeing two and three people. His eyes were bloodshot red, he was dizzy. He couldn't really, you know, get his vision together. I was scared, man. There were times when I was scared, I didn't know what to do. And we flew down to um, Houston to try to find out what was going on. So, you know, he got tests, went to different doctors, and couldn't find no answer. The season is still going on, and I'm playing games on game day, I'm going to the doctor. Francis having some more migraine headaches today, but he's going to try to go tonight. Oh, what a slam from Stevie Franchise. He played so many times when we didn't think he would. And one night he made, I think, 38 points. And when I didn't think he could get off the table, he was hurting so bad. Steve, Steve was eventually diagnosed with an inner ear disorder that could be treated with medication and a proper diet. I lost like 35% of my hearing in my right ear. So when my coaches yell at me in my right ear, I'm, when my coaches yell at me, I always go like this. When they tell me to pass the ball, I always give them my right ear, so I have to pass the ball. You know, they put me on medication, and I just slowly start to feel better as I change my diet, and uh, you know, it kind of changed some of the things that I did in my lifestyle. Between the headaches and a foot injury, Steve missed 25 games in 2002, the Rockets missed the playoffs for the third straight year. They sent Steve to represent them in the draft lottery. The NBA draft lottery has come down to three teams. He told me when he left here, he said, we're going to get first. We're going to get first. I was like, man, we're going to get you out. The Houston Rockets. Houston had its man, and the Rockets stormed into the 2003 season. Yeah, turn the prison made major improvements. Uh, I thought Rudy did a great job of, you know, coordinating Yao into the offense. And, um, you know, for myself, I thought that was one of my best seasons that I had. The Rockets won 43 games, and Steve made his second All-Star team. But in the offseason, he got a rude awakening. Not to say that I didn't like Van Gundy. It was just the way that he coached was, you know, not towards my game. I think we all bumped heads with Jeff in terms of being serious. 
I'm not sure necessarily that they wouldn't have been better served with more serious guys surrounding them from the time they came into the NBA. Beyond the Glory on FSN is brought to you by Burger King. Have it your way. We're all in agreement that the best thing for me personally is to take a leave of absence. After the 2003 season, Rockets coach Rudy Tomjanovich stepped down. He was replaced by Jeff Van Gundy. Van Gundy's style was just different than Rudy's. Rudy was a more open court kind of guy. Good job, baby. I love that. Let us pretty much do what we want. We were all, all into the isolation, and Van Gundy's a defensive coach. Van Gundy's teams were known for a tough defensive mentality and a half-court grinded-out offensive style. He was very, very uh, strict as far as the way that he coached, you know, the things that he wanted. Um, he wanted things done his way. You know, if it wasn't his way, um, you, you would know about that. The team was ran more five-man plays and try to try to develop and, and get Yao going. This is Francis, the jump pass, trying to get Yao making a little more involved. The way you have the best chance to win a championship is to be a balanced team. What Steve was used to where we ran plays from the wing, isolations, and, and get him getting the ball, getting out on a break, and just making things happen. Steve was always going to be a scoring mentality point guard, highly emotional. Uh, what I wanted him to do better was channel his emotions, and secondly, I wanted him to do uh, more on less dribbles. He's a dribbler. He's a dribbler. He's an off-the-dribble kind of guy. Great jump shooter off the, off the dribble. He's great going to the hole off the dribble. He makes great passes off the dribble. It's his game, and sometimes in certain systems you can't, you feel like you can't um, do the things you want to do. Francis is not really a setup guy. He's a scorer. I really wasn't given uh, a chance to really do what I wanted to do. I wasn't given a chance to come down and shoot threes like I do. I wasn't given a chance to, to post up like I normally do. So there were a lot of things that were taken away from my game. He was having his best year. He was having more of an impact on winning in that year than he had ever had. The way that he coached was, you know, not towards my game. There's no way that you go from making an all-star team at 21 points to 16 points unless you like missing some fingers or something. They were clashing heads a little bit. Personally, I thought he needed a little bit of that, you know. Everybody needs a little bit of discipline. Van Gundy was particularly troubled by Steve's close relationship with teammate Coutinho Mobley. From the first day I got traded from Vancouver, me and Cat have been, I mean, to this day, man, we've been tight. Our relationship is like a brother relationship, man. Whatever I got, he has, and vice versa. Mobley looking for Francis on the they're both individually great guys, and I think uh, uh, they're better suited uh, to be a part. Look at the exuberance of Francis and Mobley. I felt they were both so distracted, both of them individually from a focus standpoint, that probably a more serious guy for each one uh, would have helped them focus on uh, what they were trying to accomplish basketball-wise. Sometimes they, you know, they you know, them being together in practice was kind of hard for us to get things done because we'd be, so, we'd be too busy laughing at each other. If you can't be yourself at your job, then there's no need to work at that place. So if I can't be myself and mess around in practice, then I don't need to work there. Despite the friction, the Rockets reached the playoffs for the first time in Steve's career. Unfortunately, they ran into the powerful L.A. Lakers. Basket. There were probably six or seven plays in that series, which could have turned, you know, the series around, you know, to favor us. Inside the yell, rejected by Shaq. Frankly, we weren't ready to beat a team like that. That team was too good for us at that point, but I felt very good after that series of where we were heading. We thought that things were going in a wonderful direction in Houston. Uh, people saying that Steve Francis and Jeff Van Gundy don't get along, but we made it a couple steps forward by even just making it to this point. We thought that that was a situation for years to come, that that could be uh, the starting of something big. But in the offseason, Steve and two teammates were sent to Orlando in exchange for Tracy McGrady. 
that wasn't a tough decision. Tracy McGrady is a better player. And my feeling is that whenever you get the best player in the trade, you get the best of the trade. It was hard to swallow just because all the things that I've done for that city that the coach didn't know about. He didn't really know, you know what the city meant to me and what I meant to the city. This is the gym I built by myself. He was shocked. Um, everybody around him was shocked. I don't think anybody seen that trade coming. They were buying tickets to come see me play. And that was for five years, you know. People were coming to see, you know, the franchise coming to see me play. Oh, I think he was bitter, you know. If people don't want to agree with the way that they play, they'll just get traded like me. Steve has, he always has interesting things to say. I think everybody thinks, coaches too, think they're not replaceable, untradeable, and we're all replaceable and tradable. I always thought that that's where I, I would finish my career in Houston, but you know, things don't always work out the way you want them to. Steve's new team, the Orlando Magic, appears to be on the run. Steve Francis. Francis ducks it. I think Steve definitely found a home in Orlando. Uh, I think they have a great nucleus down there. I think they're going to build and uh, end up being a good team next year. Well, I spent a couple days down there with him. We talked, man. We talked for a while. And he's comfortable. While Steve grows comfortable with his new family, his true family is growing. Longtime girlfriend Shelby Randolph recently gave birth to a baby girl. That's probably the most exciting thing for me right now that's going on in my life. Uh, being able to have a life that, that's come from me, you know, to have a, a kid, to have a daughter. It has brought Steve and I very close. It He has slowed down a lot. You know, he, he's starting to focus on things that adults focus on. You know, he's starting to realize that family is most important. He knows how it feels not to have your father around at key points in your life. He's more likely going to be there for his. I'm definitely going to be there for my daughter every single day. Um, when it's time to go to prom, I'm going to be the guy she goes to the prom with. So I'll be there every day. Steve has never run from responsibility. His nickname doesn't allow it. Do I think the name franchise is a burden? I don't, I don't think so, man. I, I think it's, you make it what it is, you know. You be yourself, you play the way that Steve Francis, not franchise, you play the way that Steve Francis was taught, and I think things will just fall in place.